my name is Madeleine Darcy and I and my co-host Danielle McLaughlin have been running this monthly event in Cork City since January 2017. Uh, Pre-COVID we held our event in uh, the Friary Bar in Cork City uh, but since March last year we are doing a virtual online event instead. Um, We'd like to thank our sponsors, the Arts Council, Cork City Council, J. Rapp O'Mara Solicitors, uh, Hogan Architects, um, the School of English at UCC, and we'd like to thank Mike Darcy of the Friary Bar, and we hope that we'll get back there at some stage in the future. And I'm going to hand you over to Danielle. Good afternoon, everyone. We're delighted to have as our guest author this month, John Patrick McHugh, whose debut collection of stories, Pure Gold, has just been published by New Island. John Patrick McHugh is from Galway and his work has appeared in Banshee, Granta, The Stinging Fly, The Tangerine and Winter Papers. And he is a fiction editor at Fallow Media. Pure Gold is his debut short story collection. It's published in Ireland by New Island and in June it will be published in the UK by Fourth Estate who have acquired it as part of a two book deal. Reviewing Pure Gold, the Irish Times said, the stories that make up Pure Gold are searing. They seem to radiate their own heat. Vanity Fair described it as hilarious, shocking, and disturbingly well observed. I heartily agree with all that. Pure Gold is also dazzling, tender, savage, insightful, and the writing is exquisite. We're delighted to have John Patrick McHugh with us today and we have loads of questions that we're dying to ask him but first I'm going to invite him to read for us from the collection. Uh, before I start my reading I just want to point out just in case um, it looks like I, I live in a laboratory. My internet went down in my house so I'm now in a local uh, nurse's office. Uh, I'm not that paranoid about Covid. Uh, <laughs> So I'm going to read from the beginning of the story called uh, Twelve Pub. Twelve Pub. Eugene Masterson had come to badly hate himself, which, he guessed, inevitably happened when you hated the digits in your bank account and your new north-facing single room below an hilariously randy couple and the extensive event called Life in General. But wasn't it the day before Christmas Eve and they were home, his two Fado Fado friends, the brothers Adrian and Matty McNulty. And so tonight, with their benign company and the small assistance from six litres of alcohol, self-loathing could be paused and familiar merriment resumed and maybe even something akin to solace felt up. They had, so far, completed three of the 12 pubs. Rooney's, Nolan's, the crack in the scaffolding. And we're now hopping towards Linnet's Bar in Eatery, a sinking thatched roof, a rubble facade, and a tourist friendly emerald door with a brass handle which stung Eugene, Eugene's palm as he lugged it back. Matty staggered by him on the one foot, breathing from his mouth, while Adrian walked and pouted and retrieved an arm from his Tommy bomber jacket. Inside was an older crowd, three grain couples, canes, a wheelchair, and the owner, Ted Linnett, peeling apart a newspaper on the large maple counter. A holly branch was taped to the toilet door, browning tinsel tangle about a guide dog collection tin. You're flat out anyway, Adrian called, and Ted looked up, gob of jar. Eugene laughed hard at this, adding, not much work, been done in here, I see. Matty muttered, good one, huge. Over the mottled cash register, the clock read 10 past six, and thankfully the drink was starting to hit. Anticipation, Eugene knew, would soon be overtaken. Relief, humour, undepressing thoughts, fun, numbness, oblivion, excitement. 
They're at the precipice and it was all before them. They shook hands with Ted and sat themselves on the ripped and sticky stools. And then as one, the men ordered. As the pints were being pulled, Maddie explained the rule for this establishment. You may drink with the left hand only. Eugene giggled. Adrian sighed and said, what is with these rules? Eugene giggled at this too. A radio was playing swooning orchestral versions of Christmas carols, and now a posh voice is breaking over. The pong of talcum powder and wax and straight vodka. Eugene was 29, and he was wearing a wooden jumper emblazoned with a beer guzzling Santa in sunglasses and Hawaiian shorts. The Santa lit up briefly when a button was thumbed in the sleeve, and beneath this jumper, a freshly ironed shirt. Maddie was a year younger, dimpled chin, striking blue eyes, and he wore a polo shirt and a Santa hat. Adrian was the eldest by two years, stocky, receding hairline, hairline like a hastily refigured national border, and a stubbly beard that did not agree with his skin. All three wore dark navy jeans with generous cuffs that tapered over the laces of their bright leather dress shoes. Adrian turned to the couples by the wall. Well, this is depressing, he said loudly. Maddie smirked. Get over it, man. One by one, the glasses were placed shakily in front of the men. The heads, solid and white, like overnight snow, gathered in the cleavage of a stone wall. And Eugene wanted to say this aloud, or to say that he finds himself staring at the bare wall in his bedroom, willing for a release from whatever force is crushing his brain. And isn't that classic Eugene Masterson? But instead he said, Teddy, how are you still alive? It was a decent joke, six out of ten. The men talked about things they talked about, how the brothers were getting on in the States, if their football was still going, the amount of money they were raking in. How Eugene was better off without Sonia, and they drank steadily. People queued to the left of the men where they ordered. A small few said hello, wished him a Merry Christmas. Sinatra was singing. So, all going well over there? Eugene asked for possibly the fourth time that evening. Maddie checked his phone, and Adrian answered for them both. No complaints. Adrian's hands were steepled together on the counter, and he was looking at Eugene through the greasy mirror behind the bar. Happy out, Adrian said, and Eugene nodded, gulp stout. There had been a bad incident one night. A bottle had met someone's face, and for that, depending on who you believed, the McNulty brothers had been booted from the island and the country. But in reality, they're escaping anyway. Jaws had been sorted in an uncle's landscaping business. They had inherited the correct passport. And so the incident and fallout were mere acceleration, if anything. It was seven years ago now, which didn't make sense to Eugene. Where did the time go? And why did it not feel like time went anywhere? And was this a holy or scientific or economic conundrum? Still engrossed in his phone, Matty raised his glass and Eugene snapped right hand. Howls at this, Eugene found himself fist pumping momentarily. Theatrical despair for Matty, he was a good sport, and his punishment was buying a round of shots. A shudder after Eugene downed his little glass of amber, and he delighted in sharing this revulsion with Adrian. Matty then bought one for Ted Linnet, who protested, indicated his feeble heart and his many recent heart attacks. Drink the fuck, Ted. Eugene goaded, and the brothers laughed, and this was exactly what Eugene needed. It was what the doctor had ordered, though he had not gone to the doctor in the end, despite his mother's begging. There are neighbours growing up, a lumpy bronze field separating their houses out in Curran, and their inseparable school friends, and then they were a means for each other to escape, to drink, to cruise about in Adrian's car, to have something to do. And now they're what essentially tied one another to the island, beyond their parents and headstones. Sonia had asked Eugene once who he preferred of the two bold brothers. And the thought had never crossed Eugene's mind before. He tried to explain to her that he preferred neither. They were just his best friends, both together, two for one. What you make of Mourinho anyhow? 
Adrian asked Eugene. A puffy fellow with a limp was limping his way to the toilet and Matty stopped him by leaning back on the stool and using his head as a roadblock. Coleman, Matty said. The gentleman swiveled and after a moment offered a pink hand. Ah, uh, Matthew, sorry, I didn't see you there. Eugene went on. Maybe Jose is past it. The game has a lot evolved. Fair enough. But those lads aren't good enough for United. And is that his fault too? Watch, Adrian said in the mirror. Matty took the man's extended hand in his own too, shook it vigorously, and Eugene felt his toes slowly curl. He waited. And how is the shop looking these days? Matty asked. This was funny because Coleman's family business, a sports store by the sound, had collapsed during the recession and he was now supposedly destitute and estranged from the wife and kids. The man reddened and wrenched free his hand, strode on after sputtering out something about manners and breeding. Matty burst into laughter. Adrian's teeth were showing. Eugene said to Matty, you're heartless. Matty snorted at this. Come on, come on, come on, Adrian commanded, hurried, and in unison, the men sucked down the rest of their drinks. The unmistakable black tilted and morphing to slight crimson and then to yellowed sludge and then to creamy pipping clouds at the bottom of the glass. The sky was wide and darker. A head frost was furry like lynching within the pitted asphalt. An audible pop upon planted foot, another it's Baltic, lads, Eugene shouted, with a fag drooping from his bottom lip. Lads! He cupped his left hand and bent forward. The next pub was Johnny Bloom's. It was up along a further slanted road. Keel always provoked in Eugene this impression of sustained ascension, of conveyor belts. Matty was blowing blue smoke skyward, and he pinched Eugene's arse as he passed. Adrian had powered ahead of the two men his roadie leaving a glinted trail like foil torn from a lunchtime sandwich. And he swung around now, wagging his head. That was nasty, you know, Adrian pointed at his brother. Coleman's not a bad fella. The cigarette caught, smouldered, and Eugene inhaled deeply. You serious, Matty said, and his voice carried. Snowy wreaths on the doors of the surrounding houses, and in their neat terrace windows, the flicker and gleam of fairy lights. Eugene felt possessive gazing in at these windows now, like each was a glimpse of his own house, like he owned each and every tree webbed in twinkling lights, each and every present beneath, each and every room, and that those inside were stealing from him. Maddie continued, it was a joke, clearly. What are you on about? They were in front of each other now, the brothers. No, it was nasty, Adrian said, his tone grave and self-satisfied. His finger was still pointed at Matthew and Eugene wished it to be withdrawn. You're a spiteful prick sometimes, Adrian said. You know that. A car rumbled by and the three men stood aside in the margin of the road, blindly saluted. Fuck off, will you, said Matty. They walked on in silence for a few seconds, perhaps 10 altogether. Eugene said to no one in particular, Blooms is next. Would you ever lighten up? Maddie said to his brother, call me a prick like, how like. His hands were in his air, in the air, his cigarette like a baton, and he now glared at Eugene, motioned for his judgment. It was a bit of crack, Eugene reasoned. In fairness, Adrian talked over Eugene. To stop being a prick, Matthew. Is that so hard? He flicked his roly into a garden with a sign that read, Santa, stop here, I beg. It was only some fun, Eugene said. There was a small crowd outside Johnny Bloom's, perched atop the picnic table or swaying in front of it. Footprints went in all directions on the crusted grass before them, and the light spilling through Bloom's stained glass cast indigo and green and ruby diamonds over these footprints. Someone squawked, the boys, and there's a jolt of braying laughter that filled the night sky, but none of them three men reacted. Growing up, Eugene had witnessed plenty of brawls between the brothers over silly things, 
a PlayStation controller, football boots, the ownership of a transparent lighter while they smoked in the McNulty turf shed. And there have been silly fights against others too. Eugene had been the cooing peacemaker, and when he was not, he found himself throwing wild, clumsy punches. What could he remember accurately? Orange blood like topography on teeth, chesty posturing, tops stripped off and veins glowing violet beneath flesh, girls screaming and tugging on arms and wrists and necks. For a while, it seems like these were, if not necessary components for a big night out, then happy stance which could not diminish one. There is shame in retrospect, or at least distaste as the nuances of a fight evaporated, but never in the frenetic moment of a sparking quarrel. There's only camaraderie at that time, an exhilaration. Maybe it was all stupid. It was certainly stupid, but it had not felt stupid. Matty, Eugene eventually clap, what's the rule for this shithole? Matty grinning, I'm the sheriff. They settled on a booth in the corner, slouching onto the worn, cushing seating. They clinked glasses, cheered, and then Eugene inhaled that first milky sip. They pour it nicely in here, Eugene remarked to Tess. Always been a decent joint, this place, Adrian said in agreement, folding his arms, and the men nodded, and it was as if nothing had occurred outside. But nothing had really. I'll end there. Fabulous stuff. Thank you so much for that, JP. Um, I'm thinking of a line from that wonderful review you got in Vanity Fair, and they refer they referred to your willingness as a writer to inhabit the craven and unruly mind of the melodramatic team. And I'm thinking you also have a willingness to inhabit the craven minds of these slightly older characters, like these guys in their 20s in, in that extract you just read for us. And I'm wondering, was that tricky territory to, to spend time in as a writer? Were there challenges in going into the dark corners of those minds? There was challenges. I suppose a lot of it comes with, you know, the best fiction is when you get into those dark corners, when you kind of let characters decide for you and you let them decide the words you're even going to use. Um, so the challenges, a lot of it came from just experience and, and writing more and getting more confident that I could go into those areas and produce good fiction, that it didn't need to be perfect to be kind of worthy or interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah, it was a very nice uh, review that. And I, I found that line really lovely and also kind of fun because as much when I start writing, I get so into those characters that it doesn't seem melodramatic or at least it's their melodrama. You know, for those characters, it isn't melodrama. It's serious. And I suppose one of the challenges I had as a writer or maybe not a challenge, but one thing I always set out to do as a writer is to take seriously every character's problem not to look down on it, um, to poke fun of it, but in, in a way that I'm on their side, that I'm not just laughing at them, I'm laughing with them at all times. I think that is one of the things that maybe with a bit of time, I just got better at, at understanding that and kind of having the conf confidence to inhabit those kind of darker minds. So I know very much so at the beginning, I wouldn't have been comfortable. I would have been a bit frightened and maybe I would have thought, oh, maybe that's not worthy. Um, so the actual challenge maybe kind of came from getting to the point where I had the confidence to do that and the kind of self-belief that there was something worthy and purposeful in kind of exploring those darker, darker sides of, of um, the human mind. And I think, you know, the best fiction should be doing that, you know? Um, I think it's, it, it's a funny, it's kind of a common thing I see when I, when I see emerging writers is the prose is often really lovely, it's beautiful, because I think a lot of people can write really well, but then the characters, are kind of not doing anything there and if you read fiction you kind of mostly read it for the the characters and you'd want that blend between beautiful prose and really interesting characters i think that just kind of came with um experience and from writing a lot of terrible stories and then finally kind of getting into these voices but yeah no i find it a lot of fun to get um to to, to play with these melodramas and these craven minds you write the teenagers so well um 
would you have been writing when you were a teenager yourself or is this all purely remembered stuff or imagination were you writing as a younger person and I, I know you're very young now but as well as writing characters in their 20s and in midlife you do such a good job of writing the teenagers it was funny because again this is a, I've been asked this and I always used to say no uh I'd write in school um you know for essays and I, I used to always enjoy that a lot um and like I that was like one of my favorite things to do in school but in terms of I wasn't writing novels when I was 14 15 I wasn't even thinking about being a writer but then again I kind of recently I was I was just looking through old stuff and I came across like a really ratty notebook from when I was like 15 16 and there's like 22 like like I, I, the most horrendous poetry you'll ever see in your life in that book so I was in a way probably was writing but not seriously or not to a point that I felt like oh I want to write about this experience and I feel if I was writing then, I was always probably writing about people in their 20s or 30s because I thought, oh, that's serious, you know? It's only, again, as I was saying, it's only kind of now when I get a bit more confident, I kind of realise, no, it's actually as serious when you're that age, or at least it feels as serious. Um, and I suppose, yeah, I have a lot of memories, <laughs> fun memories from being a teenager, and I kind of had, uh, like, a great school and friends and stuff like that. So I, I do have, like, material there, but so much of it is just fiction um and I suppose just having the confidence to kind of like believe in a teenage voice that, that it's worthy because I I do again at the very when I was first writing I was like no you couldn't write about teenagers it had to be it had to be about a funeral it had to be rainy it had to be all these things that no you know it doesn't have to be anymore um yeah and I kind of I love like my favorite age to write probably is like is 17 just because I think as it's a really interesting age in terms of you're kind of an adult, but you're not really. You're in school, which is coming to an end. It's like perfect for fiction because it's all these like dramatic moments that's all around you. Your hormones are all off the charts. So it's just like a, a fun age. So I think with a bit of confidence, I kind of came back to the teenage uh, self. But I wasn't writing seriously when I was a, when I was a teenager beyond terrible poems. I'm probably uh, trying to write songs or stuff like that. The stories are set on a fictional islands. And can you tell us when that island first came into existence for you and why you decided to place your characters there? Yeah, the, the, the island is, is heavily based on Ackle. So in a very kind of boring way, um, my mother's side of the family are all from Ackle. So I had, I've, I've been going to Ackle since I was a, a baby and we moved around a lot as a family. So it was always like the one place that... Um, was concrete in my life, was always present. So in a boring way, that was the initial spark. But it's funny again, because um, I was always writing about Ackle while I was in secondary school, in like kind of essays and, and, and little stories and stuff like that. It was a very kind of picturesque Ackle. Um, and when I came to start writing stories without much thought, I was always setting them on Ackle again when I was in my like 19, 20, 21, without thinking about it, they were all on this island. And it was only around when I was about 21, I wrote Bonfire and I kind of realized it was Ackle, but it was my version. It was the Ackle that's kind of twisted by my nostalgia and preferences and um, my own family's history and stuff like that. So that's kind of where it all kind of started, where I was always going to be on this island without my thought. But then I kind of had fun um, kind of playing with it, fictionalizing it. And again, just again, for purely aesthetic and kind of dramatic purposes, quite fun to put something on an island because there's natural drama in the isolation you know you know you can kind of create your own little uh, areas of, of pubs you can have kind of a keel in 12 pubs I met it that's all feels like going up uh, whereas keel in reality is a bit of a scattered uh, place um, so they're kind of like the writerly concerns kind of chime for me but then as a person like I love Ackle and I love my family's history on there and I kind of wanted to see if I could play with that in fiction and stuff like that um, and I suppose there's also like a great history of kind of fictionalized, um, fictional places in short stories. And I was always kind of drawn to that. I always loved that idea that you could populate your own met up uh, place and show a scatter of different lives and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's kind of where it all kind of came from. Uh, I love the fact that um, the stories are set on an island and that I 
had a, a vague idea of what the fictional fictionalized island might be like and I wondered hmm 12 pubs count 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 but um uh, I wanted to ask you a very nerdy question really JP which is about the um uh, your way of method, working method, um, because the prose style of your stories is very rich, uh, filled with descriptive packet, uh, passages and unique similes. And I'm wondering how you achieve that in your writing. Do you find that you have to pare down your early drafts or embellish them or in other words, is your first draft more wordy or less, or does it uh, gel first time round? Yeah, I, I suppose I don't think it's too surprising to say I have to pare back. Um, usually my drafts are uh, a lot longer and they're kind of full of a lot of sentences, elaborate sentences and stuff like that. So I do pare back. Um, and I suppose it's, it's, it's a funny one because I'm just noticing recently um, I personally feel like my, my language is getting less and less ornate. It's kind of changing slightly when I compare it to something like Pure Gold, which I remember writing as like 23, 24, which is like all about the language. I'm kind of maybe less interested in that than I was. But yeah, when I, when I, when I start writing in a, in a I edit as I go along, I'm a very kind of slow writer. I kind of edit every sentences and I read them aloud constantly. Um, so by the end of a, of a story, I kind of feel like it's, it's there more or less because I've been going at it for so long and that's why it takes me quite a long time to finish a story but I am constantly reading aloud and I think that always kind of um, plays into then the, the language itself and the sentences and stuff like that and yeah and I pair back I have to pair back because I'm usually I, I'm so full of these little riffs that I find really interesting but maybe they don't work towards the the, the central kind of concern of the story um, I don't yeah I don't I don't think I've ever really kind of went back and went like, oh, I better make that, uh, maybe spice that up a little bit. I'm kind of lucky enough that usually when I have a sentence, it has, I wouldn't write it unless it has some sort of kink, if that makes sense. Like every sentence has to do a little thing for me. It has to sound a certain way. It has to kind of do something for the previous sentence and the next sentence. So I've never kind of gone back. I'm like, oh, I better put in a simile in here. Um, a lot of that stuff just comes kind of, you both know yourself when you're kind of tapping away and you kind of you're just completely not there and that's usually where all those, that kind of stuff comes and then I just have to I come in later and make it legible and make it um not so self-indulgent <laughs> so that a reader will actually want to uh follow the story to its close that's kind of usually my process so it's quite it takes a long time for me to finish a draft and then I have like a couple of readers I send it to but when I get to an end of a story I know it's going to be usable or I know that I'm happy with it I don't know what will happen with it after that but I know that it's done if that makes sense that that does make sense um and um uh, uh you do a really interesting um thing with with time as well in how your horse that's really interesting because it's quite complex the way it goes back and forth in time um would would that take you a long time to draft or do you do many redrafts of your work yeah it's funny how you horse because um that originally started as this is it's, it is a funny story i don't look too great come out of it but i i wrote a story years ago called like white ponies and uh <laughs> already the title itself but uh it was going to be quite a sweet story about this guy that falls in love with an older girl and he, he feeds the ponies and that's how they kind of they romance whatever and I had an editor um, who I used to send work to and he was he had an uncanny ability to say no to things without saying no uh, so I remember he said to me he's like you know I've read a lot of stories where the, the horse is outside the house but I haven't read many stories where the horse is inside which is obviously meant to be a metaphor you know a metaphor to, to, get, <laughs> to try something new but uh, being a dummy, I was like, oh, well, I'll just put the horse inside. So let's see what happens. Um, and I suppose once I kind of actually put him inside, knocking over things, I was like, well, that's the climax. And I just, then I had an idea instead of completely flipping it, I was like, well, instead of the climax being a horse inside, why not just have that be in the beginning and then see, can you draw a climax out? And the only way you can top a horse, in my opinion, was to go backwards in time rather than try to outdo it in the present kind of tense um, and that just kind of came from an idea 
and then the drafting process, it wasn't actually as hard as I thought it would be. Um, There's a couple of issues where I, I didn't want to make, I want to make sure a character is in the right place and this is in the right place. But I suppose once I had that initial image of a horse inside <laughs> the house, everything else kind of started to make sense. It might sound hard to believe that, but it, it was actually quite easy once I got the horse inside. And after that, I could kind of draw the relationships and the after effects of that. Um, and I just thought, yeah, it was a, in a very kind of theoretical way. I was like, well, I can't top a horse. I have to go back in time to make to make this kind of emotional uh, moment land. You know, it's a really kind of nasty ending in that story. And the only way I could make that land was if it happens almost before the horse, even though you've seen the horse. And um, yeah, so it, a couple of drafts just to make sure it all lined up, but it wasn't as arduous as it may appear. Could you give us another reading, please, JP? No problem. Um, now, this is uh, the opening of the first real time, which hopefully will make you laugh with or at me. I don't mind. The first real time. The first is efficient, mature. Hey, XX. I have a free house Friday. Want to come over? It only took you four drafts. The second text is written five minutes later, after chewing on the edge of your baby finger, after stomping downstairs and peering into the fridge and cupboards, after retrieving the phone from where you had flung it on the carpeted floor. It is blasé, indifferent, shitting itself, if you want to. You press send without looking, and immediately a structure bends in the gooey pit of your stomach, and you turn off the phone and turn it on again and pace your box room and hate yourself deeply and wait and wait and wait. Of course you've kissed others. At discos, or in the front row of the cinema, or while standing on a broken pallet behind Lavelle's, your tipsy right hand ambitiously hiking up inside a zip-tight fleece. At a house party over the Christmas, you even managed sex with a red-cheeked college homecomer named Hannah Heron. An exhausting 10 minutes spent flexing your calves to stone and thinking how the plastic snowflakes dangling across the fireplace looked more like rotting teeth than glistening snow. When Hannah asked you, asked if you could get off her now, please, you pretended to come at that exact second of instruction because you guessed it would be rude otherwise. It would be bad form otherwise. But Emily, you tell your sticky private self, is different. She's the first girl you've kissed more than once. Kissed when it wasn't dark or sweaty walled or trumming with noise. Special. You've decided she is special. It started when an informer let it be known that she somehow fancied you. She was a year younger, fresh, and you were aware of her from narrow corridors and assemblies. In reply to the news, you had you in reply to the news, you'd only shrugged and mutter sounds like whatever, yeah, and who? You then spent the rest of the week clomping past her locker, roundish belly sucked in and chest tensed in the pretense of checking the football cork board. You couldn't talk face to face, obviously, so you messaged her online chatting with shattered punctuation and three-quarter spelling. Eventually, you arranged to meet down the laneway by Keel Beach. A Sunday in February, smoky and dry, with copper hinted beneath cloud. And you were early, apparently calm, apparently collected. And her arms were crossed as she turned the corner. And you said, Emily. And it seemed then you were playing a game to discover who could avoid eye contact the longest. You talk vaguely about school, the leaving, weekend jobs, school again, all the while marching towards the cover of the playground, where, pressed against the climbing wall, you finally lick the face of one another. Afterward, walking home, your chest echoed dully like evidence, your skin glowed. Since then, you've been meeting her semi-regularly after school in the basketball court. She's not your girlfriend, technically, but for the last five week, weeks, you've been with her. That distinction has been sealed. You know nothing much about her other than that her skin is the color of street lamp against wet pavement, and that when she cracks a proper smile, a suicide edge snaggle toot peeks out. You presume this is all you need to know about her. This is how it works. 
when together, when between kisses, you act as if you're interviewing for a job you don't truly want. Security jailing all mentions of PlayStation games, the music you actually listen to, your tabletop elven army, your membership of an online forum for divorcees. Sometimes alone, you fantasize about putting yourself in physical peril for her safety, of being wounded in front of her, preferably a superficial gash, preferably because of her idiotic mistake. But mostly alone, you hate the thought of others pairing you together. You hate the thought of admitting you view her as something precious. You are ashamed in case she doesn't measure up in their estimates. You're scared that she isn't good enough, though you're not exactly sure who she isn't good enough for. You insist these are normal fears. This is normal behavior. Thanks so much for that, JP. One of the really interesting things you do with that story is the way it jumps forward at, in, in time at, at the end. And you do that one of the other stories in the collection as well with a, a short story is the title of it. And that offers a number of possible endings, which I thought was a really interesting thing to do. And it's got me thinking about how you approach endings yourself in your stories. Do you know when you've got an ending for a story? Can you talk a little bit about that? Generally, I, generally I do, or at least I know I have an ending I'm working towards, and then hopefully um, a, a character will do something that kind of swings it out of place or something changes. Um, like I like being surprised by my characters, but to write forward, I usually have a vague idea of an ending or some sort of climactic moment um, in my head. Um, but ideally, they, slight, they get slightly changed or I don't actually make that ending because the character will do something or something will crop up. But yeah, to write, I usually have a, an ending in, in mind. And it's funny, those two endings you mentioned, um, they kind of both play with a fascination I have with, with writing and with kind of reading. Um, what you as, a, as an author can give to your readers. Like the, I'm kind of fascinated by the idea of almost giving the responsibility over to, to, to readers. I kind of throw out um, pure gold. I have sequences where I give two adjectives or I describe it with two different words. And like little things like that, I'm just wondering, can you give the responsibility to the reader? Can they decide which word works for this sentence? Which word they actually want the sentence to end with? It's an idea that I haven't fully uh, figured out, but I am fascinated by it. When it came to those two endings, um, they're almost like uh, the first real time was, was almost a trial run for a short story. Because again, I, I can't want to see, could you play with this idea that a short story lingers far beyond the page? There's something else out there. Because um, sometimes, you know, short stories have beautiful endings or tricky endings and they're all shut. But my favorite uh, short stories are ones that kind of ring in your head. They don't fully end, they just ring. So kind of flashing forward or giving responsibility to, an, uh, to the reader to pick their ending it feels like a natural progression in a way to a short story or, or, the, or what I look for in a short story. Because I think more than a novel, a short story is there's a lot of trust between a writer and the reader. Um, in a novel, you kind of do want that bow at the end. You want to feel like there's an ending. Whereas a short story, you don't necessarily want that bow. You just want a sense of conclusion. You know, you, I want a sense that this part's over, maybe more will come, but you want a, a satisfaction in the sense of that kind of note. Um, yeah, so that's kind of where, what I think about endings, but some, mostly I have a very firm idea in my head about how a, a story will go, but I don't know how to get there. You know, I, I like that part where I get to figure it out. Um, and oftentimes, you know, those endings don't necessarily work out the way I thought they would, but that's, that's the fun of writing. I love that idea of, um, handing the job over to the reader to to choose the words or to choose where where the story goes to. Um, I have so many more questions, but I think we're out of time. Um, maybe very quickly before we go, can you tell us anything about what you're working on at the moment, JP? Uh, I actually probably can't. <laughs> I, I I I finish an essay which I'm happy with, which will hopefully be in the Sing and Fly this year at some stage. Uh, and this is my first week where I haven't been working on any projects. I'm 
I'm a real grump around the house, but the plan is to, to write a novel of some kind, some make. So yeah, I don't have any, I don't have any uh, exclusives or anything like that. Um, still very much at the, the idea stage. We are looking forward to reading everything that you write in the future because Pure Gold is absolutely fabulous. Highly recommend it. After uh, we uh, post this pre-recorded uh, event, we'll be um, raffling some free books as always and posting a writing prompt. And we want to thank JP, John Patrick McHugh, very very much for being our guest author this month and thank you to everyone who's uh listening in and um i think that's it danya i think that's it thanks a million jp it's been fabulous talking to you and thanks congratulations so much, again on pure gold thank you so much and it's such a pleasure thank you so much